know that story? In Exodus chapter 3. Remember that story? He's called out, and when Moses is curious, he comes to this mountain. And he sees this bush that burns, but does not consume. Whenever he gets close enough, the Lord speaks to him through that bush and says, What? Take off your shoes. You are standing on holy ground. Perhaps the most important question today. What do these shoes represent? These shoes are representative of what keeps us from going to God. When Moses took off his shoes, it was humbling. He humbled himself, he obeyed the Lord, and he took off his shoes, and he came into God's presence. And folks, let me tell you something today. You cannot have any other gods before Him. You cannot be putting anything before God and expect to be in His presence. Amen. I had a man asking me last week how the Lord treated me. I said, the Lord treats me great. Actually, better than I deserve. Right. He proceeded to tell me how he was asking the Lord to treat him that way too. But then later on, proceeded to tell me of all his loose living and all the nonsense that was going on in his life. And folks, let me tell you something. You cannot expect God's favor in your life. You cannot expect to be in His presence if you're out there irreverently using His name. If you're out there living a life that doesn't declare you are a believer. Now, I'm not saying that we're perfect or I'm perfect or you are perfect, anything like that. But folks, if you are not desiring to follow God, if you are not putting Him first in your life, do not expect to be in His presence. Do not expect to have favor over your life. Yes, His mercy endures forever. But folks, God takes your life very serious. He takes my life very serious. And we must listen to His words and heed His words. So here's the question. For you, and for myself, what do we need to remove? What needs to be moved out in our lives in order that we can come to God's mountain? In order that we can come to His mountain, in order that we can come to His presence, what needs to be removed out of our lives? You see, folks, right now is when spiritual warfare is taking place. I feel it. I sense it. I know it's going on right now. The devil doesn't want me to ask these questions because what he does not want you to have, he doesn't want you to get free today. He doesn't want you to have victory today. He doesn't want you to have, yes, thank you, he doesn't want you to have peace in your life. He wants you to continue on living like the way you're living today without reverence for God, wondering why your prayers aren't being answered, wondering why you're not having that abundant life, wondering why you're not enjoying the presence of God's people, wondering all of that thing, and He is telling you, don't listen anymore. Shut Him off because He's getting too personal. That pastor will have a right to be asking these questions of me. So what are we putting, thank you Mary, what are we putting before God? What do we need to remove in our lives in order that we can come to the mountain? Whether we realize it or not, we need to get rid of some household gods. You read about the household gods that Rachel took along with them. Remember, Jacob took his family out and Uncle Laban. They had these household gods they would set up in their, in their shelves or whatever they had in their house, like a mantle or whatever. They had all these different gods. They'd come along and they'd approach another area, another culture that had a different deity that they worshipped and thought, hey, that's a, that's a good one. So we'll take that one too. We'll, we'll put it up on the shelf. Maybe we'll get favor with the God over this, over this culture. That happens a lot. Back in the day when Paul was going through, one of the reasons he got stoned, and one, not, not with the wrong kind of stone, but the, with the rock stone. <laughs> one of the reasons he got stoned you know, and actually put to death for that stoning was because of the area he came into and they were all engraving these stones and engraving the, carving out these little gods and selling them to people. And they were making a lot of money. And this one girl who was demon-possessed, following them around, declaring them to be servants of the Most High God, 
They were using her, not Paul, but the people were using her for divination and things like that. When Paul cast out the demon of that woman, they saw that they no longer was going to get a profit off of her. And using all these, all using all these engravings, that's whenever they took it, and there's a great big riot. But it's common. And even today, whenever missionaries go to other nations, they go to Africa or South America or any other nations around the world, whether it be the Arctic or wherever, it's very common for people when they come, and folks, listen to me. It may not mean much to you, but understand this. They, they come to maybe a service. And you look out, and there's like thousands of people that come. And then you see these services, these missionaries go to Africa. And they, and they preach the gospel. A lot of people come up and they get saved. And, they, and it's like, oh man, this is awesome. But let me tell you what happens with a lot of those people. A lot of those people are not coming to God the way that we're telling you today. The way that I'm preaching today. That, and I know we've got to have full understanding. But they're coming to that saying, hey, that's a pretty good God. That sounds like we need to put Him on our shelf at our house along with the others. Do you understand and that's what a lot of people do. A lot of the people in the tribes and different areas of the world, they do this. And they say, well, that Jesus fella, he sounds like a pretty good guy. He went around doing good. Went around healing the sick. This guy's telling us all about it. It feels good to be here. He's going to be one of my gods. And that's using his name in vain. I'm not doing it. I'm just explaining to you what they do. Folks, to come to the one true God, to understand who Yeshua is, the Messiah, he is God. He's not just one of the household gods. Although His name is being used in all the households around the world. But He is not just one of the gods. He is the God. The only God. There are none other. He is self-existing. The true, great, and mighty King. That is who this God is. The only one. So what do we need to remove? You see... It's so important to understand when we come to church and take full advantage of our time to meet with God. What do we need to remove from our lives in order to come to this mountain? Are we putting anything before God? Is anything before Him? Because this is the first commandment. And there's a lot to it, I understand. You see how we cannot couple the first and the second commandment together? Are we putting anything before God? Do we realize that sometimes we set up household gods in our, in our lives? Maybe not just in our house, but in our lives. Let me ask you a question. Are you walking with God today? And the first thing you have, oh yes, Pastor, I'm walking with God. Let me ask you another question. How can two people walk together except they be in agreement? Amen. How can you walk with somebody that you're disputing with? Because to walk with someone is to be with them all the time, walking with them. And so if you're disputing and disagreeing with someone, you're going to part ways. Okay? It's just that simple. You and I have been in disputes with people, and you part ways. I can no longer have fellowship with you. I can no longer be friend to you because of our disagreement. Not that I don't love you, not that I hate you, anything like that, but I can't walk with you because we're not equally yoked anymore. I'm right, you're right, doesn't matter. We don't agree. That's the point. You understand? Mm -hmm. So if you're walking with God, you must agree with Him. Amen. You must agree, first and foremost, folks, that you are a transgressor of His commandments. Yes. That you will not be able to keep His commandments in any way, shape, or form. We must try. Yes, we must heed His commandments. We must do our best. But you will break them at one time or another in your life. And let me tell you something. That's why Jesus came. Yes, He did. That's why Jesus came. He paid the penalty for your sins. And don't think for a second He's just a decision to make. The Bible commands all men everywhere in the book of Acts to repent of their sins. Yes. Not just make a decision. Repent of their sins. Yes. This day. Not tomorrow. There are no provisions. Did you know that? Did you know there are no provisions in the Bible for tomorrow? Did you know that? You'll not find it in Scripture. Today is the day. Now is the time. You ever looked up the definition of the word now? You know what it means? You know what it says? Now. 
That's it. There's nothing confusing about that. Now is the time. The Bible is very plain. If you're going to walk with God, you must agree with Him. And the book of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 says this. Come now, let us reason together. You see, God wants to reason with you. You need to know, as the book, the book of John chapter 3, verse 16, which we have up here, God so loved you. God so loved the world. You need to know that God loves you. You know that He loved you enough to give you His Son. Yeah. And don't mishandle His Son. Yeah. Do not mishandle Him. Do not forsake Him. And do not crucify Him again. If you're a believer today, don't crucify Him again. Because it will not be to His loss, it will be to your loss. Right. If you're going to come to God, come to the mountain, if you're going to agree with Him, if you're going to walk with Him, you must reason with Him. And you must understand, though your sins be as scarlet and they be red as crimson, God is able to wash you water yes. And that's His desire for your life. Hallelujah. His desire for you is to be whiter than snow. Hallelujah. And the only way you can be whiter than snow is in the blood of Jesus. Yes. Yes. The only way. So what is keeping you from walking with God today? What's keeping you from a relationship with the one true God? And if you're a believer today, what's keeping you from walking in the victory and abundant life that He has promises for all His children? He doesn't promise that abundant life to the ones who reject Him. The ones who reject His word are condemned already. We need not do that. I'm not condemning anybody. That's not my job. You condemn yourself if you reject it. It's very simple. But He doesn't want you to do that. His desire is for you to come to Him on the basis that you need to agree with Him that you've broken His commandments. You need Him more than anything. Let us stand this morning.